Hi everyone, my name is Shauna Brandon. I'm a primary healthcare nurse practitioner, and today we are going to be talking about eyelid problems in primary care. Eyelid problems aren't quite as common as red eye in primary care, but you'll definitely still see them a lot, and they can occasionally indicate a more significant underlying issue that needs to be investigated. So let's get started. We'll begin by looking at the anatomy of the eyelid. The eyelid is a skin flap that has a mucous membrane lining to help prevent any irritation or friction to the globe of the eye. It also works to shut out significant amounts of light to protect the retina. Tears are also involved in reducing friction between the eyelid and the globe of the eye, as well as flushing out any irritation from foreign bodies. So the tear itself is produced through the lacrimal apparatus and is composed of three layers. The three layers together are called the tear film. So the outer layer is an oily layer that's produced by the myobian glands and it helps to reduce evaporation of the tears. So you can see the myopian glands up in this top picture here. They're usually about 30 glands per eyelid, both upper and lower eyelids. The middle layer of the tear film is the watery layer. It is the bulk of the tear film and it's constantly secreted by the conjunctival gland as well as being reflexively secreted by the lacrimal gland, which is here. Um, and that's in response to irritations or strong motions. And then the final layer of the tear film is the inner mucosin layer, and that helps the tears to adhere to the cornea and is secreted by the conjunctival goblet cells. So the tears, once they've been produced and they flush over the eye, they then drain through the upper and lower uh, lacrimal puncta, and then through the lacrimal puncta to the lacrimal sac here sorry, I didn't circle that very well, the lacrimal sac, and then they drain downwards to the nasal pharynx, uh, and they empty directly behind the inferior concha. So when taking a history regarding an eyelid issue, you want to make sure that you ascertain the duration of the issue, whether there was any preceding trauma, any change to the size or appearance of the lid lesion. You also want to know if it's a unilateral or bilateral issue, um, as well as any accompanying symptoms such as itch, pain, headache, vision change, discharge, fever, or toothache. You also want to know whether there's a history of thyroid disorder or use of ACE inhibitors, which could be related to angioedema. With regard to the physical examination, you want to make sure that you're inspecting both the upper and lower lids, as well as the surrounding tissue. So with the surrounding tissue, you want to look for any asymmetry between the eyes, edema, erythema, or the presence of proptosis, which is the protrusion of the eyeball. So it looks sort of like the eyeball is bulging out. Um, with the upper lid, you want to look for any drooping or redundant tissue that may be hanging within the vision field or any eyelid retraction, as well as any crusting to the lashes or edema or erythema of the lid. And then with the lower lid, similarly, you want to look for any lid malposition, presence and direction of lashes, uh, as well as any discharge or excessive tearing that may be present. The first eyelid disorder that we're going to look at is trichiasis, which occurs when the eyelashes turn inward and then brush against the globe of the eye, causing irritation. So most commonly, this is due to a chronic inflammatory lid disease, such as blepharitis, which we will speak about more in the upcoming slides. And rarely, it can be related to something more significant like Stevens-Johnson syndrome, trauma, or burns to the area. Signs and symptoms will include red eye, a foreign body sensation, and excessive tearing. It may also cause corneal ulceration and scarring in severe cases. Treatment is going to include topical lubrication as well as plucking or electrolysis of any offending eyelashes. Entropion occurs when the entire eyelid margin rolls inward towards the globe of the eye. So similarly to trichiasis, this can result in tearing a foreign body sensation, red eye and abrasions and secondary corneal scarring. 
uh, it usually affects the lower lid and then because the lid itself is rolled inward, the lashes may also rub against the cornea and conjunctiva. Causes include involution, which is mostly associated with aging and decreased skin tone, as well as cicatrical issues such as uh, herpes zoster, blisters, surgery, trauma, and burns, as well as obicularis oculi muscle spasms or congenital development. Um, treatment involves artificial tears and lubrications to make sure that the eyelids, or rather the eye globe remains well hydrated and lid aversion with tape or surgery. So often what people will do is just use a little bit of paper tape to the outer lower lid and then a gentle pressure downwards and tape the eyelid in place like that. Obviously, cosmetically, this is not necessarily the best option, so some people may consider surgery to treat the entropion. Ectropion is the exact opposite of entropion. So instead of the lid curling inwards, the lid margin turns outward away from the globe of the eye. And again, this results in increased tearing as well as it can cause potential exposure keratitis. So you wanna make sure that the lid is put back in place as much as possible as well as ensuring that the globe of the eye is well hydrated to prevent any damage to the eye itself. So causes include, again, involution, secondary to aging, uh, facial palsy, mechanical issues such as lid edema, tumors, or herniated fat, and it can also be a congenital issue. So again, you're going to treat with topical lubrication and correct with tape or surgery. So for ectropion, you want to apply the tape again to the lower lid and then you're going to apply gentle pressure upwards when taping the lid in place to help uh, bring the lid margin as close to the globe of the eye as possible. One of the most common eyelid disorders you'll see in primary care is that of a hordeolum, colloquially known as a sty. It is the acute inflammation and obstruction of one of the eyelash follicles and adjacent glands. It's usually caused by staph aureus, although it may be sterile due to complete blockage of the eyelash follicle. It's a sudden onset um, and it can be painful, red, tender lump of the lid, which is localized to the lid margin. Treatment involves a warm compress for about five to 10 minutes, about four times a day, as well as very good lid hygiene, gentle massage to the lid to help uh, clear the lash follicle and topical antibiotics may be required in more significant cases. You also want to ensure that patients avoid the use of any eye makeup or contact lenses while they have this hordeolum in order to prevent the infection from spreading. These usually resolve in two to three days by spontaneous drainage. And the way that I always remember that a hordeolum is a sty is herd them like cows or whatever into a sty. So I don't know, that helps me. If that doesn't work for you, then just don't worry anything about that. Um, you also wanna provide education to patients about good eyelid hygiene in general. So that includes things like avoiding rubbing their eyes wash hands before touching their eyes, wash hands before putting contact lenses in and keep the lenses very clean, protecting eyes from dust and air pollution and replacing eye makeup, especially mascara every six months as bacteria can grow in makeup, which I find to be a very disturbing thought and I definitely need to throw my mascara out and get a new one. Um, you also want to encourage patients not to share makeup and if they have recurrent styes, then it may be appropriate to do gentle eyelid cleaning with warm water and baby shampoo a few times a week. Chalazians are often confused with hordeolums. However, chalazians are subcutaneous nodules within the eyelid. Um, they may be tender and erythematous before eventually um, becoming a non-tender lump. It results from an obstruction of the myoene gland, which causes extravasation of irritating lipid material in the eyelid soft tissue. And if it's large enough, it can cause significant discomfort and compress on the cornea, causing astigmatism. Treatment similarly to a hordeolum is going to involve warm compresses for about five to 10 minutes, four times a day, 
Um, and if there's no improvement by one month, then consider referring for incision and drainage or administration of intertilazian corticosteroids. About 25% of the time, they resolve spontaneously with no significant intervention required. Chronically reoccurring lesions should be biopsied to rule out malignancy. And then disorders that result in an abnormal thickening of the myobian gland secretions, such as um, myobian gland dysfunction or acne rosacea, may increase the risk of obstruction and chalazian development. Blepharitis is an inflammation of the lid margin and is one of the most common eyelid problems that people experience. It can either be acute caused by a viral or bacterial infection of the eyelid margin at the origins of the eyelashes or chronic due to non-infectious inflammatory causes of unknown origin. Signs and symptoms usually involve itching, burning, a mild foreign body sensation, tearing and crusting around the lashes on waking in the morning. On examination, you'll usually see the lid margins are erythematous with a thick crust and debris within the lashes themselves. Uh, conjunctival injection or mild mucus discharge may also be present. The blepharitis can be subdivided into anterior or posterior blepharitis, which we will discuss in the next slide. Anterior blepharitis is usually related to either seborrheic or bacterial causes. So seborrheic blepharitis is within the family of seborrheic dermatitis. So you have those typical greasy foamy scales that occur at the base of the lash margin. Hyperemia of the anterior lid margin may also be present. And you may note that there's eyelash breakage and misdirection, although that is fairly rare with this condition. Uh, and it's minimally inflammatory. So treatment, you're going to encourage very good lid hygiene two to three times a day until the situation has improved and then they can reduce it to once a day. So that would include things like warm compresses and washing the eyelid with mild shampoo like baby shampoo and warm water. Bacterial causes include Staph aureus, um, as the most common cause, and usually it occurs with ocular irritation, itching, and a foreign body sensation. The lids may stick together, and there's erythema of the lid margins as well. You're going to see the eyelash, eyelash breakage and misdirection, which is common, and treatment will include lid hygiene and tear uh, supplements as needed, as well as an antibiotic ointment. Posterior blepharitis is related to a thick lipid secretion and plugging of the myopian gland orifices. If it's long-standing, it can lead to eyelid scarring. There will usually be eyelash breakage and chalazians may result due to this condition. Signs and symptoms include itching, tearing, and a burning sensation, and treatment will be lid hygiene. Um, as well as treatment with a gentle shampoo and massage of the glands to help to express any of that thickened secretion and clear it away. Um, and then as well, you may consider antibiotic ointments if necessary, if you think that an infection is present. Xanthalasma is the lipid deposit into the dermis of the eyelids. So it usually looks like a pale, slightly elevated yellowish plaque or streak and is most frequently bilaterally to the upper medial region of the eyelids. Um, it's associated with hyperlipidemia in about 50% of patients. So if you have a patient who is experiencing this, it would be a good idea to screen them for hyperlipidemia. More common in the elderly, but as always would be more concerning in younger individuals because you would be thinking of things like uh, familial hyperlipidemia. Ptosis refers to the drooping of the upper eyelid. There are a number of different causes, including aponeurotic, which is related to the disinsertion or dehiscence of the levator aponeurosis and is the most common cause. It's associated with increased age, trauma, surgery, pregnancy, or chronic lid swelling. Mechanical causes include um, scarring or other issues that result in incomplete opening of the eyelid. And then neuromuscular, such as in the case of myasthenia gravis, um, 
cranial nerve 3 palsy, or Horner syndrome. Eyelid retraction occurs when the eyelid retracts away from the normal resting position. The upper lid usually rests at 2 millimeters below the junction of the superior cornea and the sclera, whereas the lower lid usually rests at the junction of the inferior cornea with the sclera. Thyroid ophthalmopathy is the most common cause of eyelid retraction. Tumors, infarctions, and contralateral compensatory eyelid retraction due to ptosis are other causes of eyelid retraction. Treatment is based on the underlying etiology. Facial palsy results in the inability to close the upper lid and laxity of the lower lid. This can result in the eye becoming dried out, um, resulting in corneal damage. So treatment will be based on the chronicity of the palsy, but you want to make sure that the eyelid itself remains well lubricated throughout the process. Periorbital cellulitis occurs as a result of an infection of the eyelid and the periorbital soft tissue. It results in acute eyelid erythema and edema and usually follows the preorbital trauma or dermal infection. Signs and symptoms include eyelid pain, discoloration, and swelling. And it's differentiated from orbital cellulitis by the fact that the infection is anterior to the orbital septum. Orbital edema is an ocular and medical emergency. You want to have a high degree of suspicion for orbital cellulitis if you note that there is a decreased ocular motility, pain with eye movements, proptosis, or a decrease in visual acuity. This should prompt an urgent referral to ophthalmology as the mortality rate is 17 to 20 percent without treatment. It's more common in children and the elderly as well as immunocompromised individuals, usually secondary to a sinus, facial, or tooth infection, or trauma. Complications include optic nerve inflammation, cavernous sinus thrombosis, meningitis, brain abscess, and death. Skin cancers of the eyelid account for 5 to 10 percent of all skin cancers, so it's important to be able to identify these cancers when they present in clinical practice. Basal cell carcinoma is a common eyelid malignancy and usually appears on the lower lid. It presents as a firm, pearly nodule, possibly with telangiectasia overlying the nodule or a central ulceration. They don't tend to metastasize, but can cause local invasion. Squamous cell carcinomas are much less common than basal cells, but are significantly more aggressive, so need to be identified um, as early on as possible. They present as erythematous, raised, scaly, and centrally ulcerated lesions and tend to occur on the upper lid. They may also present de novo or from actinic keratosis. And palpation of the preauricular and submandibular lymph nodes is important to assess the metastatic um, spread of squamous cell carcinoma. Sebaceous carcinoma tend to occur in middle-aged and elderly patients, and they can mimic things like chalazians and blepharitis. So if you have a patient who has a recurrent eyelid lesion, you want to biopsy it to rule out uh, sebaceous carcinoma. Sebaceous carcinomas can result in local invasion as well as spread to regional lymph nodes and lungs, liver, and bone involvement. And these tumors tend to be very aggressive and may require the removal of the entire orbital content. And lastly, melanoma, which is a rare pigmented eyelid tumor. So if you have a patient who's presented with an evolving pigmented lesion, you want to biopsy that to rule out melanoma. You also want to assess for any conjunctival involvement um, in patients who are experiencing melanoma of the eyelid. So that is it for eyelid disorders in primary care. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Thank you.